All right. Good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. So before we formally dive into the material, let's just take a moment and try to generate an altruistic intention, motivation for our time so we can think about whatever it was earlier in the day that motivated us to want to check out the class and whatever we were looking for, interested in. And then think, what would it mean to actually become familiar with those things, to learn, to develop, to have those new pieces of information or habits or tendencies? How would we benefit? But also thinking about how we would then be able to benefit others. Even if we thought maybe we'd have more peace of mind, more spaciousness, less stress, how could we use that to be of benefit to others? So just take a moment to think about that motivation from earlier and then think about how accomplishing those goals allows you to be of benefit. I think that's the main purpose of our time. All right, so with that, keeping that motivation in mind, we will begin. So welcome to uh, Meditation 101. This is a four-week course. We'll meet at the same time on Friday, so we'll have three additional classes. Uh, there are only four Fridays this month, so that will fill up. Uh, are we in April? <laughs> fill up our April with that. Uh, Venerable Sangeet Kadro is also the visiting teacher this month. Uh, so she begins teaching next Tuesday and uh, teaches three Tuesdays, two Wednesdays, and those two middle weekends. So that's another wonderful opportunity for more teachings this month in uh, April. Okay, so Meditation 101, it's the companion course, in a way, to last month's uh, Buddhism in a Nutshell course, and that is uh, on the YouTube channel, which you can navigate to from the homepage of tnlsf.org. Um, and in a way, there's also a new introductory level course uh, from FPMT, which is next month's Friday night course, which is Introduction to Mindfulness. So those are the three kind of introductory courses that FPMT has. Um, so with this class, I, I always say that the, the goal, the main goal of this class is to help a person to learn what they would need to know in order to uh, start or to deepen uh, a practice at home. Uh, that's kind of the intent. We'll do some meditation, you know, over the course of the four weeks together. Uh, but it is not sort of a class on 
just coming together for guided meditation. There's uh, information that's provided uh, as well to help a person learn how to establish a, a meditation class at home. Um, we have a, another more detailed um, class that is just ending. So again, on our YouTube channel, if maybe after you finish this, if you're looking for uh, another uh way of thinking about that we are finishing the discovering buddhism course on establishing a daily practice so um, that is as we go along on the youtube channel um, as i say that class is is coming to an end but if you wanted to start that from the beginning on youtube that would um, give you another place to go after we finish all right any questions that have just uh, process questions or anything that have come up uh, for anyone, even uh, at the beginning? Nope. All right. So, um, so our center, Tupta Norbu Ling, is an FPMT center. I've used that acronym uh, before uh, earlier <laughs> today. And FPMT is the foundation for the preservation of the Mahayana tradition, FPMT. And it was established by Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa Rinpoche in the late 60s, uh, early to mid 70s. Uh, the Tibetan monks who lived in Nepal uh, after the invasion of uh, Tibet and uh, part of the um, exodus into Nepal, they met a group of Westerners uh, who wanted to receive the teachings. So there was this sort of East-West collaboration that began at that time. And these Westerners wanted to return to their, you know, they knew they would be returning to their home countries. And wanted a way of bringing back what they were learning from Lama Yeshe, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and that gave rise to what became known as FPMT, as, as a, sort of a global effort to provide materials, teachings, uh, courses, uh, and ways of studying the material uh, in the city centers. Uh, they made visiting teachers available, which is still going on today. As I mentioned, Venerable Sangha Kadro is here as a visiting teacher. Uh, so that began then, and it's continuing up to the present day, uh, this international global organization. So as an FPMT center, our what we present is Tibetan Buddhism, particularly the Gulug tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. There's four major schools of Tibetan Buddhism, um, but that is the lineage that we are speaking from and presenting. Um, but as I mentioned, it is an East-West collaboration. So FPMT's purpose is also to present that lineage for predominantly for the Western mind. Um, so FPMT isn't trying to recreate uh, what you find in Nepal, what you find in Tibet. There are centers that do that for people who have that cultural link, that cultural heritage. Uh, but FPMT's goal is to provide a space really for people who don't have that cultural link or that cultural heritage, but to still present the authentic essence of um, even all the way uh, to the path, you know, th through the path to full enlightenment. If a person chooses to engage in that depth, uh, a person may be looking in, you know, for other reasons why they might want to learn to meditate and to integrate meditation. But as a center, we do even offer much more advanced uh, programs of study uh, that go into those deeper philosophical uh, ideas as well. So that's just a little bit about our center and 
all of the material that I'll be presenting is still part of that lineage. It's how meditation is understood and practiced from the Tibetan Buddhist perspective. Uh, so that, that will be relevant as we go through. So when we say, I've, you know, the course is called Meditation 101, and we'll use that word a lot. Um, the word meditation itself, though, the English word that we're using as the word meditation, it is being translated from the Tibetan. The Tibetan is the word gom, G-O-M. Uh, the place where I am right now is what we at the center would call the gompa, uh, the place of meditation, gom pa, a place of meditation, uh, the place where people gather to meditate. And the word gom, G-O-M, means, again, in English, if we were to um, if we were to translate it sort of directly, uh, it means to familiarize, to become familiar. So the process of meditation is the process of familiarization, and particularly uh, familiarization with a virtuous object. So because there's what might be known in, in Tibetan Buddhism as wrong meditation, where we might spend time and effort and energy familiarizing our minds with things that are not constructive, with things that are not useful or helpful. Uh, you know, like when we feel like we've been slighted and we perseverate on wanting to uh, respond to that with saying, you know, getting that person back, saying like, oh, I wish I had just thought of the right insult or that kind of familiar. And like, oh, wh when I see that person again, they're really going to get it. Like when, you know, I hope, I hope I see them again on the, on the bus or, you know, I hope in the parking lot, you know, I get to, to deliver that. Um, when we're going over and over and over that in our mind, we're familiarizing our mind with that, but it's not a virtuous object. So meditation has the connotation that all of the universe of possible topics, possible uh, things that we use meditation for, they, they need to be virtuous in nature or they need to be virtuous by way of our motivation, by way of why we are using that particular object of meditation. Because, for example, a breathing meditation, which we've at least all probably heard of, is kind of neutral. It's not in and of itself. Um, it doesn't have a virtuous aspect. But if our intent in, in using that object is to uh, deepen our skills so that we can progress in developing greater love, greater compassion, greater generosity, greater patience, et cetera, than the motivation that we establish, like we did at the very beginning of today's class, that motivation would make even a neutral object virtuous because of why it is we want to work with that object. So uh, it's important to, to keep in mind that um, the objects that we meditate on always have a virtuous uh, quality or aspect to them. Okay. Any thoughts or questions so far? So, yeah, so we'll get into that as we go through. The question from the Gompa is what are, you know, what what could be objects of meditation? And um, we'll look at that in detail over the, the course. Um, there are broadly two types of objects. There are objects that um, require the use of uh, thoughts, 
and then there are objects that don't require the use of thoughts. Those are called either analytical objects or stabilizing or single pointed objects. Uh, because when, when we're picking an object that requires thoughts, the mind is active, the mind intentionally so. The mind is intentionally what I would call discursive, where we are thinking about this, we're thinking about that, we're thinking about that. The purpose of that is to generate some experience that we hold, because again, familiarization. So um, we might think of the advantages of uh, patience, for example. So and or the disadvantages of anger um, as possible objects. And so purpose of that would be that in theory, we understand that we want to become more patient. We want to have more uh, space in the mind to deal constructively with difficult circumstances. We recognize that when we fly off the handle and we respond with you know, harshness and animosity that that causes conflict and, and it's not what we want more of, we want in fact less of. And so we might decide, okay, I need to really uh, be able to draw on the drawbacks of that, that tendency that's part of my mind where I tend to be aggressive. I tend to be, um, you know, short-tempered. Uh, because if we really deeply understand the drawbacks, then spontaneously, naturally, over time, we will find it easier to avoid giving in to that impulse, that tendency, that habit. Uh, and then there's other parts of that that, you know, also support that. Um, but that would be an analytical object. The um, non-analytical objects would be like physical sensations, um, that sort of thing. You know, I, I, the breath or scanning the body or using, because for that, like with the breath, you, your breath is just present. Um, you don't have to do anything other than move your attention to it. So the discursiveness in either case comes from distractions, which we'll talk about. Um, but distractions are parts of the process. Um, but with a breathing meditation or a other bodily sensation, we or just observing the uh, arising and falling away of thoughts, mental events, for example, um, there's we're not adding intentional discursiveness. We just have to deal with unintentional discursiveness or distraction. We still have to to avoid that or to to deal with that as they arise. Um, so broadly, um, those are the two types of objects, and we'll go into more more detail. Any other questions? Okay. So when we say meditation, we've said that it's familiarizing the mind with a virtuous object. And there is, we're, we're also in a way talking about formal meditation. Um, we can take time out of our day, like at at our desk, um, while, you know, out, you know, and, and there is walking meditation, which is, you know, movement meditation is not so emphasized in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, you don't find it as talked about. Um, but, you know, if we're at a stoplight or, um, we're just sort of, uh, at a restaurant, you know, we can take time to briefly, you know, try to cultivate positive mental states. That's true, and we that's wonderful. Um, but then there is also what I would say formal meditation practice, and that's kind of more so what we're also meaning here, which is intentionally setting aside time in one's day where hopefully we're, you know, there's a quiet place, We've set things up and we'll talk about, you know, setting things up. 
Um, so going along with that, if that's what we're talking about primarily, then there's a posture that we can talk about that's part of that process that we don't, you know, if we're taking a five minute break at work or something, we're probably not going to get into meditation posture. But if we're talking about formal practice where the goal, one of the goals might be to progress to deeper and deeper uh, states of uh, focus, single pointed focus, uh, because that's very helpful in if we want to familiarize our mind with these virtuous objects, then training the mind to be more and more concentrated uh, is quite helpful in that process. Just like we can recognize if we are in school or, you know, we have reports to write or, you know, if we're in a crazy environment and there's cars and crying children and loud music, it's not going to go very well. The report writing, the studying, whatever it is. Um, but what Buddhism would point out is that our mind is kind of that crazy environment already, you know, by itself. Um, so compared to what it could be, compared to what's possible, compared to the stages of single-pointed concentration that can be developed over time with training and with effort. So that's quite helpful, just like we recognize going to the library, turning off you know, the music and so on. Those are really helpful. Buddhism also recognizes that it progressing through these stages of concentration is really helpful for being more and more skilled and effective at embodying these states of mind that we're trying to familiarize our mind with. So to support that, there's a uh, physical posture that when we establish, when we do accomplish these higher levels of concentration, there's a natural relaxation response that happens in the body. And the physical posture that we adopt can support that, can account for that. And if it's, if we train in a really, really stable posture, then when that relaxation response kicks in, um, the posture itself will help us to remain upright and undistracted. Um, and we also can kind of forget about the body when we've adopted a really, really stable position. So we'll talk about uh, now, right now, we, we'll talk about this set, what they call the seven point uh, Varochana posture. Uh, so, so this does assume, which isn't, and of course, what's being described in this posture is the ideal. Uh, it isn't strictly necessary. Most people um, are going to have to adapt it, you know, in some way. It's very difficult for most people to get all, you know, the perfect ideal posture, um, at least, you know, I mean, you can become more flexible over time, you know, that's true. Uh, but it's challenging to do the posture in its perfect form. But that's, so we'll talk about the different options. But this, all of these options do assume that we're using a cushion on the floor uh, rather than a chair. But a chair is also fine. Um, you know, if we need to use a chair or prefer to use a chair or we want to use a chair sometimes and a cushion sometimes, you know, that's fine. Uh, but I'll be discussing the options related to a cushion on the floor. So if we assume that we've started seated on a cushion on the floor, then we the first thing that we sort out is what we're doing with our legs. So there's different, there's three different options. The easiest option is just a normal cross-legged position just seated, you know, with just the legs crossed and kind of tucked. Um, pretty much everybody can do that. The next best or more stable option 
is to try to take one foot and rest it on the opposing thigh. So to, you know, meaning that, you know, you've got one foot, you know, one leg tucked and then, you know, you're resting, you're kind of pulling one leg, uh, one foot, and the foot is resting on the opposing thigh. That is called the half, you know, sometimes called half lotus in uh, yoga, um, which is, that's coming from a Hindu system of um, movement, but same general idea. So that's more stable than just normal cross-legged. Uh, if then the ideal is the full varachana posture, where both feet are resting on both opposing thighs. So you've pulled one foot up and then you've pulled the other foot up and they're now resting on each opposing thigh. Either of those require a good degree of flexibility um, and quite difficult for most people to accomplish. Um, the only thing that they really say about moving in that direction is at the start of every session, if you're in cross-legged position, to take one foot and just kind of move it as far as you can, kind of toward the direction of the opposing thigh until it starts to be uncomfortable and just kind of hold it there for a few seconds and then go back to cross-legged um, because that sort of stretching, right? You're kind of, you're stretching things in that direction. They say, they suggest that, you know, if you do that for every single session, maybe in a couple, in a year, two years, maybe you've stretched things out. Um, yoga probably is helpful too. Yoga, as I mentioned, you know, there isn't a similar, there isn't a similar movement Um technology in Tibetan Buddhism, because yoga is coming from a Hindu tradition. There's Tai Chi, which is coming from Chinese uh, tradition, but Tibet doesn't have anything similar. They don't have a movement system uh, like yoga or Tai Chi. Uh, there's things, you know, you can read their books. There's things on the internet, things on YouTube, about how to become more flexible stretches and things. I don't really know much about them, um, but they do, you know, they, they're, and talking to a yoga teacher, you know, might help um, that sort of thing. But those are the three things. We want to do one of those three things with our legs, depending on our flexibility. So, the second uh, point uh, of the posture is our back. And that's really the, that's a key aspect of the posture is what we're doing, you know, with our back when we're seated in meditation. So we want to have a, a really nice, upright, stable position. So if you are in a chair, you might want to be just slightly forward. So you're not kind of you know, utilizing the backrest. Um, and all of these things, you know, initially you're going to be activating small stabilizing muscles in the low back. Um, and you might feel some fatigue, you know, over time, and you might have a little bit of soreness. Um, but then over time, you know, you're strengthening these muscles and these, um, you know, stretching things out and strengthening and that goes away, you know, over time. Uh, but that's what we want to focus on. So we want to focus on not being like leaning forward, not leaning back, not leaning to the side, certainly not being hunched, you know, not, not kind of having a rounded spine, you know, an, an exaggerated, there's a natural curve to the spine, which is fine course, um, but we don't want to exaggerate that and um, have a really rounded spine. So we want to think about keeping a nice upright position uh, in the meditation. And that's really something to check in uh, on as, 
as the session is progressing, you know, have I started? Because like I mentioned, we're not used to supporting our upper body in that way. Um, and so we have a natural, and we may have some bad habits, you know, with computers and things. So, you know, we may start to slouch, we may start to lean, and we want to just gently correct that and kind of, um, and if we can learn these habits from the beginning, then they will, we don't have to unlearn bad habits. And um, so we really want to try to focus on keeping a nice straight back, um, you know, getting rid of any exaggerated curves and, and, and thinking about, am I leaning to the right or the left or the front or the back? which is why, again, mentioned if we are using a chair, to just be a little bit forward in the chair so that we're not uh, taking advantage of the backrest. So then the third part of the posture uh, are our hands. So typically what is suggested is right over left uh, with the thumbs gently touching and then just tucked up against the body. So, you know, they're not, they're not like extended on your knees. Um, they're not like pushed into the body, but they're just touching. They're just gently tucked uh, up against the stomach. And we want to let the stomach just go ahead and hang. We don't want to think about, you know, trying to be uptight about that. We just have a relaxed belly and then the, uh, the hands are just naturally tucked up against the belly. If you feel more comfortable, you know, you can rest your hands, palms down uh, on the thighs themselves. That's okay too. If you feel more comfortable like that, what you do want to avoid is like having your arms just dangling here by your sides. That's not a good way to do it. Um, the thing, you know, you see sometimes like the sort of the hand thing with the, that's not taught in Tibetan Buddhism. I don't know where that comes from. If, I mean, if you're doing that and you feel comfortable with that, um, but it's, that's not a hand, a hand position that's taught, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism as, as what to do with your hands. Um, so, but I would say one of those two, either just tucked up against, uh, your belly with the right over left with the, the thumbs gently touching uh, or palms down resting on the thighs. Okay, so I'll just go through these seven and then we'll circle back to any questions. So the fourth point uh, is the, the shoulders. We want to have, you know, relaxed uh, arms and shoulders, um, but we do want to think about um, so, you know, we want to have relaxed arms and shoulders. Um, and we just want to think about that the kind of elbows, that they're not like pressed into the body, but that we're also not like intentionally holding them strongly away from the body, but that they're just that there's some kind of air airflow, you know, between underneath and around the elbows and the, the underarms. Um, so we just want to think about a little bit of separation uh, around space between all of that as we as we have the the hands tucked up again. So you know, so just kind of kind of like this. So we you know the shoulders are down and relaxed. And of course, as you're getting into position, you can kind of you know kind of wiggle your way into it. Kind of just get comfortable. And then you just sort of let the your shoulders drop and go back. Um, so, of course, we don't want to hold our shoulders up. We don't want to hold them back. We just let them fall. Uh, and then we just think about, you know, do I have space around my arms, my elbows? Am I, you know, so I'm not pushing them in and I'm not throwing them out. And that's that's that. So then the eyes are the next uh, 
So we're kind of move, working our way up. Uh, so our eyes are the next point. And this, there's different, there's different systems of meditation and people will say different things. Um, typically, the most common thing that's taught on an introductory level is to have your eyes just very, very slightly open. So, um, you know, so we're not tightly shutting them, um, but they're not fully open. There's just a little bit of, uh, of, an, of an opening at the very bottom uh, of the eyelid uh, so that we're letting light in. And we, you know, we have some, I'm going to move this back down so I don't have to get a new computer. Um, so we just, you know, just very, very slightly open with the eyelids. Um, you'll, you'll find, you know, you'll hear people talk about meditating with their eyes fully open. That is taught in some systems of meditation. And at some point, sometimes people, you know, they graduate to that because it kind of challenges um, the visual field is larger, so there's more information coming in that they have to sort of reject, um, which helps to develop concentration. Um, but uh, for beginners, usually they say just very, very slightly open. If you do feel more comfortable with the eyes gently closed, that's okay. Uh, I would just also then think about the ambient light that's in the room, if you're doing that. Uh, I, I wouldn't have my eyes closed and then go into a dark room, into a, you know, shutting all of the lights and drawing all of the blinds and because the mind will gravitate toward drowsiness in a situation like that. You want to have light coming in so that you remain alert. Uh, that can be, again, you know, having your eyes slightly open, or if not, then more, somewhat more ambient light in the room so that you don't tend toward drowsiness. Okay. So now we have the um, sort of the mouth area. Um, so we want our jaw and our mouth relaxed, so we don't want to clench the teeth. Uh, typically, we want to maybe have a slight separation uh, of the teeth or just very, very lightly touching. And then they recommend, it's recommended to have our tongue resting on the upper palate behind the back teeth. So trying just at the very beginning of the session to kind of put the tongue kind of resting up on the upper palate behind the top row of teeth. That will reduce the need to swallow during the session, uh, will reduce salivation, which is good for longer sessions and to avoid having to think about what's happening in the body uh, if the tongue is sort of pressed up against uh, the upper palate. Uh, just reduces the, the salivation that happens. And then the head is the last point. So uh, we want to avoid cocking the head, you know, left or right. Um, we want to avoid, you know, we don't want to be looking up at the ceiling at all. We want to have an ever so slightly downward gaze with the, the head. So um, you know, so the chin is just ever so slightly tucked in. It's so it's not, you know, it's not resting on the neck or the chest, and it's and we're not looking up, and of course we're not going. It's just ever so slightly kind of tucked, um, so that the gaze is very gently, sort of downward when we're. So we would be observing kind of our knees, our feet, and then you know a bit of the carpet or floor that's in front uh, of us as we have a slightly downward gaze, again, assuming that we're just seated on a cushion and that, you know, we're quite low to the ground. Um, 
So those are the seven points of, again, the ideal posture. And, and the only part of that that's difficult, you know, really are the legs, you know, doing the half lotus or the full varachana. Those are the complicated or the aspects that require a high degree of flexibility. Um, and the, so the rest of it are applicable even to a chair. You know, the other aspects are applicable to a chair. Um, because if and if we're in a chair, then we do we want we might think about um, how supported we feel uh, with our feet. Because uh, some people, you know, the chair you might be shorter, and then you might um, your legs might not fully feel supported. So you might want to think about putting a a cushion or something underneath your feet so that you don't feel like you're kind of stretching out. That you feel kind of supported. Uh, if you're, again, if you're using a chair. So any questions about the seven points or anything that we've covered so far? All right. So going along with this idea of a cushion on the floor, the concept of a cushion, um, there are meditation cushions uh, that you can buy. And that's kind of a very individualized thing. Um, there's different, different shapes, different materials that they're made of. Uh, traditionally, they've been, they're made of buckwheat hulls. Uh, they're filled with buckwheat hulls. Uh, that's the traditional material. There's higher tech ones now where they have memory foam and other kinds of foam, you know, uh, to, to sort of conform to the body. Sometimes, you know, usually they are circular. Sometimes they can be rectangular. Um, and then there's uh, what's called a zabutan, so which is uh, also would go along with a cushion, would be a larger um, sort of a mat that you would put the cushion on. The purpose of a zabutan is really to protect your ankles because um, those are going to be so, and that is applicable mainly if you have a, like a wooden floor. Uh, or a tile floor that you're going to be, because your ankle bone is going to be, you know, resting on the ground, uh, and it might it might hurt a little bit. Uh, and so the purpose of a larger zabutan, which your cushion is see, is on, is really to uh, to provide support for your ankles and your feet. Uh, so that's something that you might consider depending on your situation. If the carpet is plush, then probably you won't uh, be uncomfortable. And the, like I said, you know, when I say that it's personal, there's different heights. Sometimes people, you do generally want to um, be raised, you know, so you do want to um, be seated slightly forward, meaning that, you know, so you're seated under something that's raising you up and creating kind of a slight downward slope that will relieve pressure on the knees and the hips to have that raised kind of slightly forward sloping position. Um, but how much of a slope it really is pretty individual. People who are taller or shorter or way more or way less, they they might like different things about. Um, some people don't really use the traditional cushions. They use just kind of a mat, kind of they'll have the zabotan and then they'll just sort of have maybe a one inch or two inch mat on top of that because they don't really like the larger. So that's kind of a trial and error sort of a thing, just trying like, how does it feel? Can I, can I kind of forget about my body? Is it, is it something uncomfortable that's happening? Um, 
do I, you know, I, I use actually the rectangular memory foam kind of thing. That's what I like. Um, so um, there's Samadhi Cushions, Dot com they sell cushions there's the monastery store which you can google i think it's maybe the monastery store.com um, that's where that they sell the mountain cloud seat which is what i have um, that i've had for years and years um, so there's different options and people just have to kind of figure it out um, and I think the Samadhi Cushions people, they might, if you email them, they might help you. Um, if you tell them like about your size and your, they might give you some suggestions about uh, thickness and that sort of thing. Any thoughts or questions? All right. So now we will switch gears and we'll start to, to talk about the two main skills that we utilize in meditation, in any given session of meditation. And these are the skills of, you could say, mindfulness, or you could say introspective uh, awareness, or you could say concentration. Uh, I'm sorry, well, so mindfulness and introspective awareness, those are interchangeable uh, as, as one of the two skills. Concentration is the other, just to linguistically be clear on what I was saying. Um, so sometimes you might hear mindfulness or you might hear introspective awareness. They're referring to one skill and then generally concentration is used um, for the other skill. So in this context, then mindfulness is being used in a more technical way than we might have heard it in popular culture previously. Uh, because in popular culture, mindfulness is often used to mean what I would call non-judgmental momentary awareness um, or, you know, being with the present moment. Um, and that's different than the technical, historical use of the word mindfulness in Buddhism. Uh, mindfulness is, you could say, um, or interest, introspective awareness or mindfulness is the ability to uh, pay attention in a way that recollects what the point of something is. Um, so in a way, so it is a way of observing or becoming aware uh, that is related to am I or am I not uh, concentrated on my intended object? So mindfulness is an aspect of how we approach any given session of meditation where we are noticing or observing whether or not the mind has moved from the intended object to something other than the intended object, a distraction. And concentration then is the holding to the object itself. It is the kind of glomming on to the intended object, the stickiness of the mind to the intended object, the kind of tightened focus. So when through introspective awareness, we observe the arising of a distraction, we tighten down our focus and we, we kind of hold more firmly 
to the intended object. So these are two complementary skills that we're using uh, at different points in, in meditation. So it isn't just that we're like, oh, this is happening and that's happening and that's fine that that's happening and now this is happening and now that's fine too. That's kind of non-judgmental momentary awareness. Um, and that's not mindfulness in this more technical sense because it's not fine that we've moved from the intended object. Of course, it's fine in the sense that it's unavoidable. It's fine in the sense that we don't beat ourselves up about it um, because it's part of the process and there's nothing we can really do about it except we can notice that it has happened and we can intentionally move the mind back to the intended object. And that's what we ought to do when we're meditating. We ought to give ourselves that instruction that when I notice the arising of distraction, I will very quickly move my mind back to the intended object, whatever it is, whatever we've decided that that session is going to be about, whatever the thing that we've chosen, because we choose that before we start meditating. We decide, I'm going to do a session on the breath or a session on the disadvantages of hatred, uh, what have you. And then that is that object for that session. And anything that falls outside of that object is a distraction. Um, whether it's virtuous or helpful or you know, useful or destruct, all of those are distractions if they fall outside of the bounds of the intended object. Um, so we might start, you know, we might get overwhelmed with some positive thing, you know, we might think, oh, you know, if we start thinking about patience, we then we might think, oh, my, my mother is so patient and how wonderful. And that's a lovely contemplation, but it falls outside the bounds of meditating on the disadvantages of patience. So we ought not indulge in how thinking about how wonderful some really patient person is. Um, even that, even though that feels great and it's, it can be lovely to contemplate, but that wasn't the goal of that session of meditation. So it does, we do characterize it as a distraction for the purposes of that session of meditation. So these are the two things that we apply. We, um, we tell ourselves at the beginning that I will notice when my mind wanders and when my mind wanders, I will bring my mind back. So in this way, um, introspective awareness is sort of like a, is a more global sort of spotlight. It's just kind of a corner of the mind paying attention to how we are meditating, paying attention uh, to how it's going. And then when that spotlight, you know, shines a light on a distraction, we then kind of use concentration, which is more like a laser, uh, kind of a tight focus to narrow down and to stick the mind back to the object to, to just sort of, you know, redirect and then hold to the object until of course the next distraction arises and we have to do that whole process again, because as we all know, when we start to meditate, it's distraction after distraction after distraction. And often we don't notice them right away. Often we notice them a minute or two or five after we've been following a conceptual story about this thing that happened or what I want to do or what I'd rather be doing or what's what cool thing is happening later daydreaming, you know, basically, or um, so, but if we give ourselves the instruction to notice quickly and to move the mind back, then over time, as distraction arises and as we move the mind back again and again and again, 
we naturally get better at holding the mind to the intended object. We will find with repetition, with effort, with consistency, that the distractions uh, arise less frequently and they are less intense when they do arise. They, they, they're shorter in duration and they're less, um, you know, kind of magnetizing. They have less power. We can more easily shift back to the intended object. Um, but that is after many years of, you know, day, day by day by day, building those habits and those tendencies. Okay. Any thoughts or questions about those two, how those two skills work in any given session of meditation? All right. So then let's kind of switch gears again. And now we'll talk a bit about the Buddhist presentation uh, on the nature of the mind, because of course that's what meditation is. It's related to the mind. Uh, it, it, there's a posture that supports um, our ability to kind of forget about the body. Um, but meditation is, you know, we're cultivating the mind. So when we talk about mind from the Tibetan Buddhist perspective, we are definitely talking about something that is separate from the brain um and so from the buddhist perspective you know the mind is not an emergent property of the brain it is not one with our physicality um, certainly the brain and the mind are interrelated um, if we know of course that if there's damage to the brain the physical brain that can impact the way in which the mind can be expressed through the body uh, but buddhism would say it can't it doesn't damage the mind itself you know if a person isn't able to express through their speech or you know through their through their body express certain aspects of the mind that doesn't mean that they don't have those aspects of the mind or that they've done some damage, you know, that like, because, you know, of course, from the Buddhist perspective, um, and a person doesn't, of course, doesn't have to adopt um, Buddhist philosophy in general uh, for meditation or even necessarily this aspect of the Buddhist teaching for meditation. But Again, like I said, you know, our center is a Tibetan Buddhist center and we're coming, we're presenting this lineage. Um, you know, so we, we can't say that, you know, like in a future life, they won't have that capacity because the brain was damaged, you know. So, you know, in this life that they won't be able to speak in a future life. So, of course, the mind isn't damaged by what happens to the brain. Um, but it is true that certain things, you, you might lose the ability 
to express aspects of the mind through the body given damage to the brain that's definitely true so they are uh, bound up they are linked but they are separate uh, phenomenons from the buddhist perspective that the mind is something that existed prior to the coming together of the body in the womb and it's something that persists after the dissolution of the body at death uh, that that mind and body associate uh, in the womb and then that association persists until death but mind and body are separate phenomena from the buddhist perspective and the mind then is said to only be at its base level is said to possess uh, two qualities uh, that which is clear and knowing uh, is is what uh, it is said uh, the mind is that which is clear and knowing that's the buddhist definition of the mind uh, or that which possesses clarity and awareness so clarity in this is a sort of more technical uh, term and what it refers to is that the mind is an energy that doesn't possess a particular definable shape or color or size uh, it is just an energy and by awareness we mean uh, or it is meant that when the mind is directed toward an object the mind will develop some sort of internal representation of that object it will quote unquote know or become aware in some capacity uh, that object uh, it will develop greater knowledge greater um, awareness fami fam familiarity with whatever the mind is directed toward and that process again is mediated through the body for us in this lifetime uh, you know inevitably in order for us in order for the mind to know visual objects the mind is directed toward them via the what they would call the i sense consciousness or the i sense power in order for the mind to know auditory objects we have to utilize the ear sense consciousness or the ear sense power etc so of course um so in the, in that sense uh, buddhism talks about six kinds of minds the five bodily senses and then the mental sense consciousness so we develop awareness of again visual objects tactile objects gustatory objects you know all of that through mediated through our eyes our tongue our ears our sense of taste our, our sense of touch um, etc but you know smell uh, etc but then that refers to just sort of the raw sensory data shape and color rough smooth uh, bitter sour sweet um, you know high pitch low pitch etc um, you know loud soft pitch or volume um, but then the mental sense power after that raw data is coming in the mental sense power will put things into categories um, will make judgments about what's coming in say oh i like that kind of sound that kind of sound is harsh i prefer this flavor i prefer this aroma i prefer this kind of uh, tactile sensation that's what the mental sense consciousness is doing that comes along after the five bodily sense powers uh, but generally this is all working you know in concert working together although it's 
certainly possible that the mental sense power can be activated without any input from the, you know, as in uh, imagining something. If we imagine that we're on the moon, if we imagine that we're looking at the Buddha, um, then, you know, what's happening in the room with our eyes, our ears, our, so that, and that's, of course, very much related to meditation, that uh, meditation happens in the mental sense power. And it's kind of the distractions that can happen through the physical sense powers. Um, we might hear something discordant or distracting or see something or smell something or, you know, or the bodily, there can be a pain in the body, et cetera. Um, and those are things that might take us out of. And of course, we can also be distracted by other things only occurring in the mental sense power like, um, oh, I wish I was at the beach or, oh, I, you know, I can't believe that that person said that unkind thing to me earlier today. Um, so of course the mental sense power can also, uh, take us away from the object of meditation, the intended object. But that's, so that's a little bit about, um, the nature of mind as it's understood in Buddhism. Any thoughts or questions about that topic? Nope, okay. So when I say then, so just again, um, a person doesn't have to be Buddhist to practice meditation, um, but just to provide a little bit of Buddhist context for the technology of meditation, maybe a little bit of advertisement for um, how, historically speaking at least, meditation has been used, what it is used for, um, it is a technology, an inner technology, that, it, you know, the reason that it was taught, the reason that the Buddha gave it, you know, to his disciples, and, and it has been uh, transmitted generation to generation uh, over that 25, 2600 years to the present, um, is because it plays an integral, indispensable role not only in developing the mind in kind of more ordinary ways, like we were talking about before, like having less, um, uh, you know, stress, um, having a more relaxed, you know, way of moving through the world, having greater spaciousness. Um, from the Buddhist context, uh, the reason that this technology was given is because it's understood in Buddhism that we can not only develop the mind in those more mundane, more limited ways, but we can use meditation to fully unlock extraordinary potential uh, of the mind, our our innate capacity to actually also become a Buddha. Um, so the historical Buddha was not mystical, was not unique. Um, I mean, you know, unique in a statistical way, like compared to the majority of other sentient, you know, other humans, but not unique in the sense that his mind was somehow different than any other mind that has ever or will ever be. His mind had been fully ordinary, just like our mind. And then he trained his mind and accomplished the result of what we would call enlightenment, um, which then is the flourishing of that mind from ordinary mind into enlightened mind. And when a 
when a being possesses enlightened mind or transforms into enlightened mind, that being is now a Buddha. That being is an awakened one. Uh, the Buddha, the Buddha means the one who is awake. Uh, Sangye is the Tibetan for Buddha. And because Buddha comes from Sanskrit, uh, but Sangye is Tibetan. Sangye refers to the complete eradication of all of the problematic, harmful aspects of the mind, um, our tendency to for maliciousness and jealousy and you know all of the problematic parts of the mind and the complete development of all of the beneficial aspects of the mind limitless love limitless generosity limitless patience um, perfect ethics perfect compassion uh, you know perfect wisdom and so on uh, so the complete elimination of all of the troublesome parts of the mind and the perfection of all of the beneficial aspects of the mind is the way that the literal uh, sort of the transliteration into English of Sangye, which is how, which is what they use to refer to an enlightened being. Um, so uh, just to, you know, just to say that that is why the Buddha gave his disciples meditation is to not have a kind of a more limited goal, but to use that technology to unlock that potential. And that potential is shared by every sentient being. Um, it's, you know, so it's, it's present then, of course, even in the minds of animals, but animals can't meditate. So we are in a position to actually unlock that potential of mind itself um, because we can meditate. Um, we have what in Buddhist philosophy would be called a perfect human rebirth, which you know is the kind of existence that is the most well suited to developing that potential that all sentient beings possess. So that's just a little bit, of course, but like I said, there's no reason to hurry into that kind of training or to even, you know, it isn't suitable for all people. Uh, it's not something that everyone will uh, adopt, but just to, you know, to explain that uh, how meditation historically has been used, what it, what it's used for in that way. Um, and there's a little bit, as I, as I mentioned in the Buddhism in a Nutshell class, which those recordings are on the YouTube, you know, there's a little bit, there's there's more that's fleshed out, you know, in a in a in a way, because this class is meditation 101, so you know we're we're not going to flesh that out uh, in the same way. But any questions about that? Trip. Yep. Um, during the course of the next few weeks, um, will we cover like sometimes a distraction is some kind of mental event that maybe is something from the past or something that's very difficult that might carry a lot of emotional baggage. So it's bigger than one thing. Will we cover like how to work with that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in an in an introductory way, yeah, we'll look at the um, the hindrances and the antidotes in a in an introductory way. Yeah. Thank you. So to expound a little bit then on, you know, kind of ir irrespective of 
what so as i mentioned you know historically the goal of buddhism is to unlock one's potential for full enlightenment but um irrespective of that specific goal it's also the case that the mind uh, that you know we've talked about it is uh, a an energy that becomes that can generate uh, awareness uh, or familiarity with what it's directed toward in meditation then as because what we've said also is that meditation is intentionally familiarizing the mind with a virtuous object so the premise the kind of underlying premise of meditation is that engaging in these sessions leaves imprints in the mind um, of whatever it is that we have familiarized our mind with in that session so after having done a 15 minute session on the disadvantages of hatred we are now slightly more familiar with the disadvantages of hatred than we were before we engaged in that meditation and that slightly more is permanent um you know that we've we've kind of added that to the mind um just like and you know i mean this isn't this isn't really saying anything that you don't already know but it's just a shining a light so it's kind of, it's not different really than um you know taking up a hobby and you know practicing the violin for example um at the beginning you don't know anything about where what to do with your hands what to do with your fingers you know you don't know anything about placing the bow and what kind of pressure and how fast how slow none of that um but then every hour that you spend learning those things under the guidance of someone who you know is a valid teacher and really knows how to you know address all of the posture and what to do and all of the things you are better you know not just 5 minutes later you know but you're better that next day and you're better and it builds and you can become a true expert you can become a world class extraordinary if you spend enough time and enough effort and you know you're able to really focus and devote yourself to it because every single time you engage in an individual session of practice you're laying down stronger and stronger imprints of being able to do that and in a day so of course and of what buddhism would say then though also is that this is always happening that the mind everything that we do when we're awake um is laying down these imprints because that's what that that's just how the mind works it works be, and because it works that way we can leverage that to learn to play the violin by laying down these you know building and building these layers of imprints but also as we're going about our life as we're going to the store as we're doing work and so on we are laying down imprints of how to be better at accounting how to drive you know whatever it is um but so then we can say well in a lifetime we can define this lifetime as a set number of mental moments mental events um you know discrete um individual imprints that comprise one given lifetime and so given that totality of moments a person if a person devotes themselves to playing the violin they are 
sucking up a lot of those moments to have that particular outcome. If a person wants to be a gymnast or to be fantastic at, you know, whatever it might be, then they are out of the totality of those moments. They've collected and are accumulating and packaging a lot of those moments to result in that particular outcome. And that's the underlying premise of meditation is that we can only have so many moments in a day. So if we have 15 or 20 minutes of moments once or twice, or maybe even three times in a day that are directed at developing loving kindness, developing compassion, developing wisdom, developing patience, developing ethics, um, then we are aggregating those moments to bring about that outcome, to bring about the outcome of being a patient person, being a loving, kind person, being a generous person, actually embodying what we are setting the mind on. Um, and, you know, by default, then too, we're crowding out the not so great tendencies and habits. We're not, you know, to the extent that we're thinking about being more patient, etc., we are actively countering impatience. Um, because again, we can only do one or the other. These are kind of opposing, we can't be patient and impatient simultaneously. So the more patient we are, the stronger that habit becomes and the more ingrained and second nature it becomes in the mind. And then naturally, spontaneously, as our default, patients will just be there in the mind. It will just be part of the mind, as, as is perhaps impatience or short-temperedness in our current experience. We might, we might say that, or we, or we might say, you know, you know, whatever the things that we're trying to work on that we're noticing are part of our present experience. We can shift that by intentionally giving ourselves these periods of time because these imprints grow and they stack and they become deeper and more uh, ingrained and more natural to the mind over time. And then the result could be, you know, could be, the result could be enlightenment. Or, you know, if that's not our thing, or, you know, then the result could be that we naturally, easily, spontaneously relate better to others. And we naturally and easily and spontaneously are more, you know, of whatever all of the positive, useful, constructive mental states that we're really focusing and choosing to um, have these imprints to create these deep imprints in the mind of are. So it's really a process, you know, a day by day by day practice of creating new habits, new tendencies, new familiarities. Any thoughts or questions? Nope. All right, well, I think that's a good stopping point for today. We've made progress because there weren't a lot of questions, so I just kept going and going. Um, so we've made good progress on the material. Any final thoughts or questions? Anything that would be helpful? I think I'm a little sleepy today, so I apologize for not being interactive, but um, thank you. <laughs> I'll probably watch again on YouTube. Thank you. I'm a little sleepy too, so it's yeah. all right. <laughs> Yeah. 
Oh, all right. Well, we have three more classes on the remaining Fridays. And uh, yeah, and like I said, check out Venerable Sangye Kadro's visit. And uh, yeah, I uh, will see everybody next week, I hope. <laughs>